As you're able, please stand and join in singing hymn 474 in your blue hymnal, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. Please be seated. I'm Paul McLean, Associate Rector here at Calvary, and on behalf of the uh, people and clergy, welcome to uh, the 101st year of the Lenten Preaching Series. We're delighted that you're here. And a reminder, too, to please silence any of your phones or any devices. And uh, as you're leaving today, please take a moment to go by the Thistle and Bee pop-up store, a ministry started here at Calvary for honey, granola, all kinds of great products. Uh, in our uh, great hall next door, along with the Episcopal Bookshop, has a little pop-up store uh, with uh, many of the books written by uh, some of the preachers in our series, as well as a lot of gift items. And then, uh, if you haven't done so already, make your way downstairs to the Waffle Shop, uh, which is a, a citywide reunion every day, only one of the few places in town where I think you can get turnip greens and pork belly with a side of waffles. <laughs> We're delighted to have as our speaker today, George Robertson, senior pastor of, of Second Presbyterian Church. I got to know George through the Memphis Christian Pastors Network, where he's been a leader. And this was a group formed to bring about racial reconciliation and healing in our city. And uh, he's been very instrumental in helping that come about and, and, and takes that very seriously as part of his ministry. George also, uh, following the death of Eliza Fletcher, George and Second Presbyterian Church were really a pastoral ministry both to this congregation that was so affected here at Calvary and to our whole city. And George, we're so grateful for that. You've been a pastoral presence in a lot of ways. You're a pastoral presence to us as fellow pastors, and we're grateful for your collegial way about you. We're delighted that George is preaching today, and he'll deliver his message after our centering music and our scripture reading.
reading from the Gospel of Luke. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Here ends the reading. It is a real honor to be here and to be among so many good friends. I see familiar faces all over the place, and my, my wife and I were here Friday to hear Tom Shadiak, and uh, he, he only used 25 of his allotted uh, 30 uh, cuss words, and so I asked if five could go forward, but I'm not going to get anywhere near that. I see too many of my people here. But I am really honored to be among you. You know, we have a lot in common as uh, Presbyterians and Episcopalians. Uh, we, we both trace our history to the British Isles. We like thing, all things British. Uh, we have similar, uh, we eat British food. We, we prefer haggis over the fish pudding, but they, we have similar <laughs> tastes. We plagiarized your 39 articles. We took the 39 articles of the Pesca Anglican Church and we plagiarized them and turned them into the Westminster Confession of Faith. So I, th I, really, think, I really think there's not much difference between Episcopalians and Presbyterians. In fact, I, I say that uh, an Episcopalian is just a Presbyterian who can read. <laughs> so I'm glad Scott did the read, I mean, Paul did the reading for us today from Luke chapter 5. This man, this, this poor, isolated, lonely, paralyzed man taken by his friends and laid at the feet of Jesus for healing. The Surgeon General, of our current Surgeon General, Vivek uh, Murthy, uh, just released last year in September his, his uh, report on the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. I think it'll turn out to be a legacy achievement. It's a very, very important, helpful, startling, bracing report. I'd urge you to read it. He says early on in the report that half of Americans report being isolated or lonely or just not belonging. Half. And then he goes through the rest of the report report tracing the social and uh, health uh, uh, re results uh, among the American population. Thing, uh, disturbing things like that those who are experiencing loneliness and isolation, it, it, uh, it increases their risk for premature death on the scale of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Increases the risk of heart disease, respiratory illness, viruses, dementia, anxiety, depression, suicide, economic failure, educational distress, falling behind. It, the report traces the impact of isolation and loneliness almost every negative thing we can think of in our society, including crime and violence. 
it, it's fascinating. Early in the report, the Surgeon General gives one of the primary reasons for this feeling of isolation and, and uh, disconnectedness is the decrease of attendance at churches, synagogues, and mosques. 1999, 70% of Americans said they belonged to a synagogue, a mosque, or a church. In 2020, 47% answered not that they were not going, but answered they don't belong to any church, mosque, or synagogue. Now, the Surgeon General's in a delicate place. He can't make too much of that, but he puts that data out there and leaves it as this, these centers of faith that have historically brought us together as Americans are disappearing in their significance in our lives. In Protestantism, we talk about de-churching, but there's apparently de-mosking and de-synagoguing too. And it's killing us. What's the answer? I, I, the answer from this text, I'm a Christian preacher. I'm, I'm speaking in a Christian service. And uh, there are a number of, of my people here. So my first obligation in my conscience is to apply this to us first. Because our Lord tells us to take the log out of our eye before we start messing around with the speck in somebody else's. And the log in our eye is that we have quit caring as much as we should of, of, of finding that isolated, lonely person, going toward them, picking them up by faith, and taking them to our Jesus. In our tradition, we believe that we bring someone to Jesus, he builds a personal relationship with them. He restores them to their relationship with the Heavenly Father, their Creator, forgives their sins, starts the process of healing them from the inside out, and eventuates into their total healing in a resurrection body in the world to come. I think there's also an application for us as a community, too. So I'm preaching or speaking not just as a, as, a, as a Christian preacher, but as a community leader. And, and I, want you to, I want you to think about, I want you to think about Memphis as the paralyzed man on the mat. Not just an individual, but the city of Memphis and all of her inhabitants and citizens and ask yourself, where can you grab a corner? And where can you, where do you need to cut some holes and walls in order to bring healing? Remarkable healing, as this text ends with. Extraordinary healing. Where can we grab a corner? And where can we cut some holes and walls that would bring remarkable people to Memphis? We, we're all over the map here theologically. This is an eclectic gathering. It's wonderful. But the one thing that unites us, I am almost certain today, is that we love Memphis. I was here Friday. Tom Shadiak was leading us in chants and cheers for Memphis, right? How can we love Memphis and bring remarkable healing? I think it's going to take cutting some holes in some walls, kicking down some doors, overcoming some obstacles. And as you would expect from a Protestant preacher, three obstacles. <laughs> no poem. The first obstacle that we, we find in this passage to this man's getting to healing, getting, in my tradition, to Jesus Christ for his healing. But the first obstacle is religiosity. You, you heard uh, what Paul read about uh, these leaders, these religious leaders who uh, were sitting around Jesus. They had made an effort to be there. In the paragraph before, we've, we've, we see Jesus is, now he's attracting so much attention, crowds are starting to, to press on him. And so he's in the habit of going to desolate places. And then the next sentence is, in one of those places. 
one of those desolate places, these religious leaders find him, they get the front row seats, and they're not there to learn anything, they're, le they're there to catch him, to criticize him, ultimately to kill him, because he's disturbing their religious business. Any of us can be in the religious business, which is preserving our little empire, wanting the status quo at almost any cost, anything it takes just to keep the status quo, to keep our places of power, influence, uh, income, at the expense of true compassion. So these religious leaders, you could say the pastors of this man were blocking him from getting to this teacher who offered some hope of healing. What is, the, what is the battering ram to get through this obstacle? What is the saw by which we could cut a hole? These, uh, these, these friends saw those religious leaders there and other obstacles, and they didn't say, sorry, pal, we tried. They said, got to, there's got to be another way. Crawl up on the roof, cut a hole in the roof, lower him down right in front of Jesus. And notice that they didn't wait until he became worthy of it. The text doesn't tell us, you know, there was a really faithful man. He was a really religious guy. But he just couldn't get to the holy services. It doesn't say anything about his faith. In fact, the, 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 the passage never says anything about his faith. These friends went to get him. They grabbed a corner. They put him on a pallet. They cut a hole in the roof. They're lowering him down. And Jesus saw their faith. Maybe he didn't have any. Maybe he had lost his hope. Maybe as a little boy he had prayed, Lord, it'd be great if you could get, get my legs back so I could play with my friends on the playground. And maybe as a teenager he prayed, maybe it would be great if you restored my, my ability to walk so I could go with my dad out into the fields. And as an adult, it'd be great if I could walk so I don't have to sit here and beg. And then maybe the day came when he quit praying. Maybe the day came when he quit hoping. And he needed surrogate hope. He needed the faith of his friends. The application for Jesus followers, and I tend to make that distinction between Jesus followers and Christians because there, there's a young girl in my church told her parents a few weeks ago, you know, I think I would really be buds with Jesus. I like him a lot. It's the Christians I can't stand. The application, for, the application for Jesus' followers is by faith, we go to the hopeless and connect them to our Jesus. In our community, no matter what your religion or what your faith, you must ask yourself, is it one that brings healing to my neighbor, or is it something only for me? Is my religion doing anything for anybody else? You, 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 some of you might, might say, I'm, not, I'm just not religious. Well, I beg to differ. You might, uh, I think everybody is religious. And God has made us that way. You may not acknowledge there is a God, but you, but you do give away that you are religious. Because as, as prim and proper as you're sitting here today, when you get down to Oxford, you become like a Joel Osteen charismatic. <laughs> Religious. We approach things religiously with zeal. The question is, are you using your religion to bless somebody else? So as a communitarian, I say to you, you know, as we're cutting holes in the walls of our churches or our religion in order to cut holes of hope, into the despair of other people in our, in our community. It really doesn't matter to me what your church affiliation is or what your label is if you'll just come and sit down and help a second grader learn to read at Elsie Ball or Hanley Elementary. If you're an atheist, but you still have concern 
for your fellow, for your neighbor, then it'd be great to sponsor a paid internship for a member of the gang. We must not let our religiosity keep us away from each other, and God forbid that our religiosity keeps us from bringing hope and healing to the lonely and isolated. Faith breaks through that wall. Another obstacle that we see in this, in this story is the, uh, is the uh, obstacle of, of crowds. Seems pretty obvious. But, but the crowds represent those who are doing everything that everybody else is doing, just going along with the flow, doing what everybody else is doing. The crowds demand outward appearance. The crowds demand uh, conformity. The, prou- the crowds demand that we polarize against each other that we not cooperate. The crowds demand that we that we cancel one another. That even if somebody is doing something that we agree with, then we we can't agree with them. We we can't participate with them because that would give credence to their their belief system and then it would give them more power. So we got to take the opposite no matter what it is. The crowds the crowds of our society are polarizing us. What is the battering ram against this crowd think? These crowds that kept, I mean, they, they surely looked and saw the, they saw the paralyzed man on the mat. Nobody moved. They surely heard the kerfuffle that's going, over, that's going on over the, overhead. They didn't do anything. They just stayed like every, they wanted to blend in, do what everybody else did. But these four friends... They went against the crowds with love. They loved their friends so much, they were willing to think way outside the box and cut a hole in the box to get their friend to Jesus' feet. Just after the George Floyd tragedy in our country and riots and protests and violence and polarization occurring all over the country. I got a call from a, 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 a major American journal. And uh, they said, somebody told us we should call you because we're here in our, our uh, editorial offices and we're, we're looking across the country and we're noting all the hot spots in the country where the, the violence, the protests and marches are occurring and we we keep looking back at Memphis, and it never lights up. As far as we can tell, there hasn't been a violent protest yet, and we've been poking around trying to figure that out, and somebody told us to call you, that you might know why that is. Why is it Memphis blowing up? That was their question. And I said, well, you did call a preacher, so you're going to get a preacher-sounding answer. But I, yeah, it's real, and I invite you to call some other people. I gave them other numbers. The people have a lot more to do with it than I do. But I said, the simple answer is love. There is something shared here in the community of faith across denominations and across religions that I have never experienced anywhere in my ministry before. We are real friends and we, we show up at the same things together to do things that bring healing to our community. And we've yet to have a theological discussion. It's not because we're opposed to it. We just don't have time for it. So when Paul and I show up at the same place, or Scott and I show up at the same place, or Scott Morris and I show up at the same place, or Micah Greenstein and I show up at the same place, or Anwar Arafat and I show up at the same. We know we have different theological systems. And we're not going to convert each other. But we love each other.
We love each other. I said, I invite you to call these other ministers. And not just the ministers. There is, we have not back room discussions, that sounds negative, but they're in back rooms and they're, they're not smoke filled anymore. We, we, we get together with politicians and, and civic leaders and say, how can we bring healing to the city? Our greatest good is not just to keep down riots. Our, how can we bring justice here, healing to this city? Third obstacle is the obstacle of dehumanization. That's a fancy way of saying, or reductionism. Fancy way of saying, failing to recognize someone as an image bearer of God. This, this, man, this man was considered to be an invalid, invalid, because he couldn't work. He couldn't pull his own weight. And, and he's viewed as paralyzed. That's his identity. These four friends saw something more in him. They were his friend. He was their friend. And, and they saw some promise in Jesus that could bring him flourishing as a human being. And Jesus saw it too. Because when he was lowered in front of Jesus, Jesus, in effect, said, I obviously see that you can't walk, but I also see you're more than that. You're made in my Father's image. You're a, a multifaceted, beautiful person, thinking, feeling, relational creative. You're a person. And so I say to you, I want to start your healing from the inside out. I want to heal your relationship with God. I forgive your sins. I remove your, not only your, your guilt, I remove your shame. It would be logical that this man is saying, I am, I am, uh, I, I am, I, I, I've done this to myself. Sam's coming to tell me I have five minutes. Thank you, Sam. Don't get any ideas, first or second press people. <laughs> Jesus said, I want to heal you from the inside out. The others are aghast. Who can do that but God alone? Jesus effectively says, right. So stand up too. He heals him holistically. Let us not reduce each other to our illnesses and our bodies or one or two characteristics, but seek whole healing. I, I want to end in a way I hadn't originally planned to, which is always dangerous, so pray for me. But pray for yourselves. <laughs> but, the, but yesterday, one of my heroes passed away. He was uh, in his 80s. He was an elder in our church, an elder emeritus. His name was Bill Weber. He finished his days at Tresvent, which I think proves that all Presbyterians eventually become Episcopalians <laughs> because all my people move there and then, then go on to heaven. It's probably it takes us that long to learn to read, to do the paperwork, to get into <laughs> to Tresvent. He was a resident at Tresden. I visited him at last Thursday. Bill Weber was a hero because of a stand he took in 1964. In the spring of 1964, elders of our church blocked the entrance of our church to African Americans seeking to worship. It's part of the Kneel In movement. It occurred for eight weeks. Bill Weber was a young deacon standing on the other side of that blockade of elders, rebuking the elders, saying, we're not going to tolerate this, and leading a young group of his colleagues and, and participating with the pastor and eventually 
ousting those elders and reversing the course of the church. Another friend, another hero, Lillian Hammond. Lillian was one of the first to befriend me when I moved to, to Memphis. And Lillian was one of those students who was blocked from the door of the church. She and Bill Weber were within feet of each other. She kneeling on the steps in quiet, uh, quiet protest against the, the policies, and Bill on the other side rebuking his fellow elder. They didn't know each other, just feet away. Eventually that stronghold was broken, and we, we have been repenting ever since, and, and, and repenting in order to turn toward living and, and, and reflecting the complexion of heaven in our, in our sanctuary. And my predecessor led a public repentance uh, for that shameful, that shameful past, and Lillian showed up, and Lillian forgave us. In September last year, we dedicated our new organ, a rebuilt organ. Nobody stole our pipes. <laughs> and that dedication was, was led by our new organist, Leo Davis. Choir was led by our choir director, Calvin Ellis, both who act happened to be African-American. I was sitting on the, on, on the uh, platform uh, getting ready for, the, for the, uh, the, the, the dedication service to begin, and I, I frankly didn't have the greatest attitude about it. It was a, going to be a long night. I'm sorry about that. This is Lent. But I... I did look before I stood up at our choir, which was majority African American. Then I stood up to sing the first hymn, and the congregation stood up the first time I'd seen them from where I was sitting. And it was almost exactly half white, half black. Time stood still for me as I looked around the room, and then I saw. Bill Weber in his wheelchair, and Lillian Hammond on her cane. And I acknowledge publicly to Lillian, look at what you've done. Look at the healing you've brought in this city, in this church. I was standing in Memphis I was standing in a church that looked like Memphis. I was witness to a miracle. No different, not any less spectacular than this paralyzed man getting up off of his mat. And I saw two warriors who just decided there was a sickness in their city. It was focused in that church, and they moved toward that sickness together from different worlds, just feet apart, but they each grabbed a corner, and they each cut a hole in their own way. Last Thursday, I went to visit him at Tresman, and I knocked on the door, and as I was waiting for his wife to open the door, I turned around to think, who else do I know who lives across this, the hallway from them? Can you guess who it was? Is Lillian Hammond. Two old warriors. Don't tell her I said old. Two old warriors. <laughs> Finishing their days together. Rejoicing at the fruit of their labors. It's remarkable. And as many things as we see wrong with this city still, we must not lose sight of the fact that in 50 years, we've come from blocking the doors of churches, we weren't the only ones, 
to welcoming, proactively pursuing reconciliation across racial lines, giving testimony to what we say is the gospel in that way. In their example, let us dream for the next years and put feet to our faith and go toward this city, ailing city, grab a corner, cut a hole, and bring hope and healing to the isolated and the lonely. May I pray with you? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world, a world that didn't want you, a world that was opposed to you, loving so much that you would die for our sins. And thank you, Heavenly Father and Holy Spirit, for raising our Savior to life. And we beg you to cause the life of Jesus to pulse through the veins of Jesus' followers. Then I pray for all my friends here and this city that you would have mercy on us and you would bring to this city the shalom of God, the holistic healing peace of God, and make us agents of it. In Jesus' name, amen. George. George will be here at the front steps if you'd like to greet him as you go. As a people who grab corners and cut holes, let us bless the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.